on the Creative Media courses there. And for the last few years, I've been working on a PhD looking at arcade games as creative platforms and creative materials. And as part of that, subset of that has been uh, a few different practice-based works. So I'm going to take you through one of those in, in the next few minutes. So that's called the VR Super Gun. So I'm going to explain to you why it, why it exists, what is a super gun, and then how I made the VR super gun. So it'll all become clear as I step through it, piece by piece. Now, so yeah, here's my table of contents. So first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about the preservation of arcade games. Next thing I'm going to talk about is what is a super gun. And then I'll look at how I actually went about building this project. And then I have my conclusions at the end. So if you take a look at this picture here, um, arcade machines as materials. Maybe I'm sure some of you at some point you've played a game that originated as an arcade game, perhaps an in an actual arcade cabinet or maybe in emulated form or as part of a compilation on some games consoles. So the actual game software themselves, it's quite easy to access and to you know play those. The Internet Archive has free in your browser lots of classic arcade games that you can just call up and load up in your browser. But the actual outside, the physical part of those games, the actual enclosure, they, you know, they're a little bit more difficult to preserve and to recreate. So part of this project for me really was about looking to see how could I do that, and but also to try and retain some of the kind of tangibility that people enjoy <laughs> when they engage with these in their original form. This picture, I took it a few years ago. I saw an advert on Done Deal, and somebody in the loot was selling a load of arcade games. Now, they actually wanted to sell them as a batch, and there was no way, unfortunately, that I could accommodate or afford that. But it was just interesting to see these. I took this picture. This was this guy done composting, recycling, and these machines were just sitting there in a shed. And there was a rooster that was living in or on one of them and left a few centimeters of rooster excrement on top of them as well. But you know what? Those machines, somebody could still take those, clean them up and get them going. So there's a really active scene as far as restoring arcade games and you know preserving these pieces of digital games history. But what I for this project, what I really wanted to do was, yeah, try and make the try and preserve the kind of physical integrity of it in a way but also make it so that it's playable. Now, there are different solutions that people have when they want to present a arcade, classic arcade game in a gallery space. This is one solution. It was at the Texas State History Museum. It's an interesting kind of approach they took, kind of a traditional sort of art gallery approach. We take this artifact, we enco encase it behind, you know, a kind of a, a people-proof case and it's there, you can look at it, but you can't play it, okay? So it lets you kind of, you know, you can inspect it, you can get pretty up close to it, but you can't actually play it and games that they're playing. So how do you try and bridge this gap between actually using and experiencing the real tangible artifact, but also at the same time, you know, kind of keeping it at a kind of safe distance. So that's what this project was all about. Now, before I talk about what a virtual VR super gun is, I'm just going to tell you what a regular super gun is. So, 
And the thing about this is I have a project page for this, and I like checking my Google Analytics, and I would see these you know, hits on the page with like coming from Fort Bragg. And you're going, okay, Fort Bragg, and you know, it's kind of a military base there, so sorry, they didn't find the super gun that they were looking for. <laughs> but, um, this is what it actually is. So basically, tho all those arcade cabinets from 1985 onwards, they had a standard wiring, so that you could swap in and out the, cap the game board. It's kind of like a game's cartridge, and there was this standard called the JAMA standard, introduced by the Japanese Arcade Manufacturers Association. So basically, they standardized this 56-pin connector. You can see it around there. And yeah, you could plug in and out the board. So it didn't matter what cabinet you had, you could just switch the board. And it meant that the arcade operators, that they could, you know, didn't have to replace the whole thing. They could just swap the board <coughs> and they could make more money and made their lives easier. And it benefited the industry as a whole. But anyway, if you take that wiring and you condense it down into a form that you can plug and play into your TV, kind of like a games console, this is what you have. So, you know, nobody really owns the wiring scheme. It's, it's pretty standard stuff. So different companies, reproduce them. So this one on the side, the left, that's by a German company um, <coughs> called, um, it's a guy called Arcade Forge. So this allows you to plug it into a TV with a SCAR connection and just play your game with, with regular joypads or to just you know plug in your own. And this one on the right hand side, that's by a French company called Retro Electronics. But they both do the same thing. They allow you to play these game boards. This is what one of those game boards looked like. Now this is a, a pirate one. And, but it's, it's basically the brains of it are a, you know, the same, it's an ARM processor, like a mobile phone, okay? And, but it's got that common 56 pin connector. But all these games since 1985 have always had that common 56 pin connector. Even if, as actual computers, they were very different. They, what they had to do to be compliant to this standard was to have that connector to um, be playable with a minimum of, with a max minimum of three buttons, and also to, yeah, work within, you know, a kind of a standard 4-3 proportion screen. So kind of the non-widescreen screen at a low resolution. But once it, the board conforms to that, it's known as JAMA compliant. And yeah, you can play it in a super gun or an arcade or a compatible arcade machine. Now, so when I was making this project, the things that I wanted to consider were, well, I wanted to make it so that you can play an arcade game in a virtual space through a, through a kind of a digital reconstruction of that shell. Now, I wanted to have it so that you could also do that remotely. So that was quite a challenge. And it took a lot of trial and error and a lot of trying out different combinations, but eventually got it working at a reasonably low latency. So you can play it, but I'll show you in a few minutes now what it looks like. Also wanted to have it so that it was fairly portable. This was just for practical reasons. If I wanted to demo it to somebody, I want to be able to just put it in a little case and bring it with me. And also, if I wanted to make another version somewhere else, and just if other people wanted to copy it. So it was made with kind of that kind of low kind of hardware footprint and low budget in mind. Also, partly because of just where I am with my own graphics, but also to fit the theme of it as something that's, you know, inspired by games from the mid 80s, late 90s. The actual look and feel of it is kind of low polygon, hard polygon. And yeah, I think I mentioned already that it's network enabled, so you should be able to use it across the network. And where possible to use open and free software. So it was quite an adventure in just trying out all of these different tool sets. And some of these perhaps might be useful for you and your projects going forward. So for the actual 3D environment, what I settled on was A-Frame. A-Frame is a great open source framework for building web VR. So VR that works in your browser. You can, if you can do web design, you would be able to pick this up very quickly and easily. It, um, and the great thing about it is you can use it with any of the headsets that are out there. You could use it with Google Cardboard, you could use it with the Oculus um, Go or Oculus Quest using their web browser, or you can just use it on a regular computer screen in flat 3D mode. So it's very accessible, and your audience isn't bound by a particular you know, com computer type or operating system. You just need to have a browser that's compatible with it, and Firefox seems to be the best for this. So. When I was actually going about reconstructing what an arcade cabinet was, <coughs> or one of the um, more common ones, I just went to the web, so there's lots of archives there. And there's an amazing you know, amount of resources out there where people pool, their, pool their, their minds together and their time, and you know, as far as restoring these things, all the information's there. So basically, there were these CAD plans. If you want to actually you know, 
reconstruct any of these machines or repair ones. So this is one that's called a Dynamo HS1. Yeah, HS1. So basically this one was the common uh, machine type that was used for Street Fighter 2. So I chose that because I, it's quite iconic. And so what I did was I took these plans and then I, using, well, I'll come back to that in a moment, using Milkshake 3D, which is an old um, 3D graphics tool that emerged for editing Quake models, I traced the plan, but did it in as low polygon a manner as possible. And you see there, the tr number of triangles on that is pretty basic. But the idea of that was, again, it was kind of going for this kind of um, early 90s kind of 3D polygon look that was in arcade games of that era, but it was also just for myself as, as learning and trying to improve my own 3D. And again, because we're using this kind of low, low hardware resources to make sure everything <coughs> moves as fast as possible. Now, later on in the project, I started using Magic of Voxel as well. And Magic of Voxel <coughs> is like 3D pixels, and it's a great tool. So if you're someone who can think in 3D, and, but you find maybe regular polygon modeling kind of tough, Magic of Voxel, but you like drawing, Magic of Voxel is excellent. Again, it works really fast. So in this picture here, I am, um, kind of doing a reproduction of the coin door, albeit in kind of this low kind of blocky <coughs> mode. But yeah, this is what the actual thing looked like. So there's a two sides to it. There's the hardware side and then there's what you get on the screen. So in order to screen up there on the top right, you can see that little arcade board I talked about before. So what's happening is the video from that is going into the PC and it's appearing on the HTML canvas as a texture. and that's been streamed at a low enough uh, or a fast enough rate that you can actually play it. There's like a little delay and it depends on the computer you use, but it is possible, it is playable. Um, also, you have to be able to control <coughs> it, okay? So all of this is happening through the web browser. We're using the Arduino Mega, you can see it up there. So that's been used to trigger all the, all the pins. So like each of those pins on that 56 pin connector, they're like the up, down, left, right, coin, player one, all that kind of stuff, okay? So you control it through your web browser and it streams into the web browser. And on the bottom you can see, in the middle there's this thing, LGX, so that's a, that's a capture unit, so that's streaming it live into the, into the PC. So the same capture unit, you know, for you doing YouTube um, playthroughs or whatever. And yeah, so that's it. So basically it works in the web browser and you can stream your game into it, play it live, and, but the other thing about it is that kind of sets it apart a bit different from the other, well, what sets it apart from what's out there already as far as web arcade machines you can play in kind of emulated form. This one actually allows you to connect with the actual real tangible arcade board on the other end of the connection. So, I mean, it's kind of like a, a subjective thing. Like, you know, you could listen to a song on Apple Music or you could get the original first edition vinyl record. And sometimes it's just about having that connection with the original, you know, production line run, you know it came out of the factory at a certain time, a certain era, and all of that. And yeah, maybe it's, again, it, it's tangible, but that kind of connection is kind of intangible. And um, yeah, so, and also the other thing about it is you actually are getting sort of a record, a document of what goes on inside the machine. So I put some attention into, you can actually go, and this is kind of in an exploded mode at the minute, so the sides are off it, but you can have it all close up as well. But the idea is that you can go in and you can check out, well, what actually goes on inside these machines? Because, you know, you go to play an arcade game, unless you're the person who repairs it, it's a black box, it's sealed off, you don't really get to see what's going on in it. So it's kind of to <coughs> allow people to know what's going on inside them and provide a kind of a visual document of that as well. So that's the VR super gun. And I guess just to conclude, like, you know, as far as like, you know, aesthetics in, in terms of actual gameplay, you know, it's, it's the look and feel, but remember the feel also, you know, it's about, yeah, it's about retro, we think of low resolution graphics and maybe chip tune audio. And then in something like Shovel Knight, you were able to use those, those styles, these restricted palettes, these visual styles, but then use the best of what the new technologies allow you as well. So you can have like bigger play fields, special effects and all that. So that's one way of kind of harnessing retro aesthetics. But another way of, kind of recreating that feel of retro gaming and it's coming in more and more that I'm trying to plug into with that project is actually, you know, reconstructing the environment and the actual um, game space that you're in. So any of you are really interested in a project that's, that's in development still and you might have seen some videos about it online but what they're doing here is 
They've made a shell for emulation, emulators, but they actually have recreated all these other kind of um, aspects of gameplay from that era. So, for example, having to plug in power cables, having to pass the controller to the next person, all of these kind of rituals that are associated with gameplay of that era. So it acts as kind of a historical document. So, yeah, those are my thoughts about um, arcade games and retro aesthetics and, you know, just trying to, you know, obviously we can always reconstruct what's on the screen, but also thinking beyond the screen and outside the screen as well and the tangible and the environment. So, yeah, I think I'll leave with that. Thanks very much. <laughs>
and writing cover stories on people like um, Scarlett Johansson, The National, uh, Yonsu, Sigourney Um So my kind of entry point into games was very much from a multidisciplinary kind of just a lover of the arts who was trying to take the, the ineffable kind of aspects of what made them amazing and then trying to figure out how to write a story about that and, and explain why, why they had the emotional impact that they did. Um, and then I was at Edge for three years as a features editor and got to write these 16 page kind of um, really enjoyable features about like the launch of uh, PlayStation 4 and get to talk to all of the designers involved with that. And, uh, so journalism was essentially just paying me to indulge my natural curiosity about the things that I loved. And so it was a, it was a dream to get to do that. Um, but what it means is that I can't uh, show up here tonight and, and you know, tell you the secrets of, um, of game design from a, a technical standpoint. But I wanted to talk about one of the aspects of making anything, whether that's games or, or music or visual art, and that's that at some point you might want to actually show it to somebody. Uh, and I feel like that's just as worthy of a bit of conversation um, as the actual making of the thing. Uh, because it's a very vulnerable thing to, to show anybody something that you've made. Um, and, and so like even just seeing Kieran's project, to me, I was like, it felt like you were seeing something really personal, seeing into that shed where he where the, the game cabinets originally housed. And, and I think that's a very, it's a very generous thing to make art um, because you get to invite people into that. So six thoughts, I'm gonna to try to blast through these because I think I spent my entire 15 minutes uh, on the first slide, off to a great start. Uh, so smash the amethyst butterfly uh, is this, this phrase that I heard that I, that I loved because at the start of a project, you have in your mind the thing that got you excited about the project was the perfect idea of that project, almost like the, the archetypal, immaculate thing that you haven't made yet. And the reason that it's perfect and that it's immaculate and pristine is because it's in your imagination and it hasn't, you haven't touched it, you haven't made anything yet. Um, so the first thing that you want to do is just to smash the living shit out of that that perfect thing and, and make something that instead of being bejeweled and perfectly symmetrical, it's going to be kind of lopsided and one of the wings is gonna be, have aluminum foil on it and the other one's going to have something mismatching and uh, because we wanna bring our humanity to the things that we're making and so we want them to, like the things that are interesting about us as human beings is uh, the weirdness and the imperfection and the kind of facial features that don't quite line up and, and all of those things. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of the amethyst butterfly, like this perfect, oh, this tattoo's gonna look amazing, it's the Lion King. And then, but this is, this is arguably the more interesting of the, of the two <laughs> tattoos. It's definitely more interesting. It's, like that's not gonna go to the top front page of Reddit, but <laughs> that's gonna spend like six months there. And, uh, so don't agonize over originality. Um, I mean, for instance, like I completely stole the Ameth Amethyst Butterfly advice from uh, the author Liz Gilbert, who wrote uh, Eat, Pray, Love, and she's written uh, an amazing book on creativity um, called Big Magic that I recommend. Um, and so at this point, I just, I snapped a photo of a couple um, sort of adventure kind of mazes. My, my son uh, is like a budding game designer He's eight now, but like I think he did these when he was five or six, and so this is he had seen an adventure maze that I did like back when I was younger, and and so he did his own. And it's it's not totally original. Like you can see the Triforce in there, obviously a bit of Zelda obsession, <laughs> and this one's just straight rip off. Like I mean, and why would you give somebody that many life hearts? Like this is. This is like, I need to like introduce him to Binding of Isaac or something where you get like one and you're supposed to be thankful for it. Like, um, and so you've got all these Pikachu, which is obsessed with. And then, uh, so he's, he's been spending like dozens of hours. He has this um, very obsessive streak that's very relata relatable to me. Um, so he's spent like dozens of hours. He's creating his 
he wants to create 240 um, of these playing cards. Like he just has this particular number he wants to hit. And so like copper sword, you know, not the most original thing. Skull spider again, like Zelda obsessed. And then a Goomba, like he's like not concerned with, um, he's not concerned with being original, even though he is, because he has one that's like Viking note and it's, like you get a note from a Viking that says you're doing a great job. And that's <laughs> like, I, I still can't really understand what that's about. But, but when all of these things get mixed together, when you take a bunch of things and then just kind of jam them together, like you get really interesting things when you mix those chemicals. And I uh, also just want to crush the idea of the lone kind of genius who goes into a cave and waits for divine inspiration. And then it, it, he gets a he or she gets a, some calling from the, the great beyond and then has this moment of insight. Um, the e evolution of ideas is very similar to biological evolution in that uh, evolution is a tinkerer. It works with what's kind of laid out on the bench. It never skips steps. It's always these kind of painstakingly incremental steps forward. And that's why you have simultaneous discovery where you have people, like Charles Darwin gets all the credit for being the, because we love this mythology of the lone genius. Um, it's very attractive to us uh, because it gives us this kind of hero figure. But Alfred Wallace, um, as, a, as I'm sure you know, he was basically spelling out the process of natural selection and, and evolution at the exact same moment. And they kind of arrived at this at the same time because they were, they all had the same facts um, in front of them and they were, somebody was going to come to that conclusion. And so in the same way, uh, in the work that you're doing, don't be afraid of, like we're all working with just what's laid out on the, on the workbench in terms of points of inspiration and even, even mechanics and uh, design aspects like that. So as a journalist, I, I, there were a few things kind of from that side I just wanted to, I don't work in journalism anymore, I'm working at Riot Games. Uh, I lead the kind of creative efforts around uh, publishing, so I'm letting all of you know uh, what cool things Riot's making and new Le League of Legends, uh, sort of related things. Uh, but curate your critics, uh, because you can, once you share something, then all of a sudden the, you invite in everybody's opinion. And that can be, that can be very, it can put you in a very vulnerable position. And that's, and what I'm not advocating is walling out um, feedback, but just make sure that you're listening to voices of people that understand what you're trying to make and are actually kind of on your team because there are a lot of unhelpful opinions that you can get. And <coughs> one of the mistakes I made very early on in my career in writing reviews and, and that kind of thing is that uh, there's a there can be a performative aspect to it because you get rewarded for being entertaining and being entertaining can be a very different thing from being illuminating uh, there's a there's a quote that i love um, by i heard it from stephen pinker uh, but he he said pessimists are seen as protecting you from something whereas optimists sound like they're trying to sell you something uh, so the more down on things you seem, the more seriously you can be taken. Uh, and I think a lot of, I see a lot of um, critics, like I have, fall into that trap. Be beware of sharing your work prematurely. Um, so <laughs> the things that you're making, there's an embryonic state um, as you figure out what your work wants to be. and. As some people will say, as your work figures out what your work wants to be, um, it's, a it's in a very vulnerable state. And so spend some time, Stephen King gives this advice in terms of writing, uh, don't show your work too early uh, because it can actually really injure what you're trying to make or can completely put you off. I've, I'm working on a, on, a, on a personal piece of writing that's now kind of at 200,000 pages, I think. Um, <laughs> Obviously, it'll need to get winded down at some point. But I, when I was about, I'd say about eight or nine chapters in, I shared those pages with, with a few different people. Uh, and these were actually people that I trusted. And I didn't get any kind of feedback in return. 
So it wasn't that they said, oh, this is terrible. They just were very busy and they didn't get around to reading it. And I, I, got, I went into the state of paralysis where I couldn't work for about six months uh, because I was just so convinced that they had hated what I had sent them. Uh, whereas they just were very busy themselves and just hadn't had a chance to look at it. So if I'd been a bit farther along, I might not have felt so paralyzed by that fear. Uh, this might be relevant because obviously as part of your design, you're having to come up with lots of ideas. If you can't come up with 10, like come up with 20, come up, come up with 50, take the pressure off of the ideas that you're creating. Uh, when you come up with very few ideas, it's so easy to get married to those ideas and feel like each one of them needs to be amazing. They don't, they shouldn't. Um, there should be lots of terrible ideas in there. Like really, really horrible ideas. Like get a lot of horrible ideas down because sometimes those ones end up being the more interesting ones. And then finally, um, resist judging the weird, disturbing, like kind of offensive yeah. shit that your subconscious burps up. Um, because right now I feel like, um, I, I see it a lot like kind of looking from now from the outside back into the critical world. I feel like there's, um, the writing about art is, is sort of getting dragged into, into the culture wars. And, and so things are getting moralized in a way that I think isn't always helpful to the creation of art and making yourself vulnerable. Um, so this was, in, when I made this in Google Slides, it was animated. I don't know if you played inside, but yeah. I, hope, I hope everyone has. I hope it's like required part of the curriculum. But this is like a massive, like this fleshy blob with like limbs and appendages uh, sticking out. And then it just is like rolling across and knocking scientists like out of windows and they're falling 10 stories and onto the ground and exploding. And it's just this bizarre transgressive kind of work and um, I, th I, I want more of this to exist in the, in the world uh, rather than the safe kind of plays that might be inoffensive or um, maybe draw a bit less criticism. Um, maybe this is like the f first state of play that has had like two embryos in it uh, presentation, but, but yeah, like this is Chris from The Simpsons and I, I could just, this kind of stuff I could just, look at all day long because it's 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 the thing that you're is going to stick in your mind because it doesn't conform to expectations so like you're never going to quite be able to figure out why the hell that woman's arms are as long as that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, I feel like I'm I like when your children just do weird cool stuff like you just want to share it with people so um, my my wife and I went away and and he and his sister were staying with my parents down in Wicklow. And, and so he drew, I think, like 15 of these like monster prototypes and then like cut them all out very meticulously and they were all la laying out on the floor. And, and I love this one in particular. And so I am planning to get a tattoo of it at some point. And I talked to a Riot colleague of mine named Oliver Chipping who did a lot of the environmental design for League of Legends. And he very kindly turned it into <laughs> a badass uh, monster. Um, but he almost like just recreated the exact, like the stitching and then just the weird, I probably won't do the number twos, it'll make me look like the Zodiac Killer. Um, <laughs> but like, why did he just decide that this bandaged, like pot-bellied person with like no neck and just teeth kind of as part of his neck, like why did it need to have the number two all over it? Um, it did because Two. <laughs> it's, it's kind of a hitchhiker's guide kind of logic, I think. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you. Uh, just uh, while I, I um, Jason, while I, while I kind of get ready for the next yeah. person, maybe uh, the uh, there's one of our students here who will have heard me talking referring ad nauseum to Limbo, oh, which yeah. is on the must-play games. Um, maybe kind of, you know, why, why Inside over Limbo, or do you think Inside was an improvement in or this is as much for me uh, as it is for them, and to allow me to get this space. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, um, so far polite to actually kind of face people you're speaking with. Uh, so one of the most enjoyable assignments that I had at Edge was 
to go to Copenhagen to interview Arns, the kind of head creative director of, of Play Dead. Um, and, and our interview was specifically about the spider in Limbo. Uh, and I, so I'm very attached to Limbo just because I feel like there are incredibly personal themes in that. There are, even though we were talking about the spider, I can I always get too curious and I can never kind of stay too focused on the one piece. We talked extensively about about that character in 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 the game, but I, I felt like there was something in there about about religion um, because of how little the game tells you, um, and it, it felt like there was. There was something that had a, a slightly, it, like in, it embraced chaos in a way that where I feel like a lot of games will just will spell everything out and make all of the text very explicitly clear to you. With, whereas Limbo, um, it doesn't give you any meaning to wrap around the experience, uh, and and so I started asking questions along those lines, and he got so uncomfortable because it was such a vulnerable thing to him that he. He almost just, because I didn't realize we were going to be talking about that, um, I, I, I don't feel comfortable talking about it. If I'd known we were going to be talking about it, I wouldn't have agreed to the interview. All of a sudden, I felt like, whoa, what did I, what did I step in here? Uh, and then later that night, like, like 1 o'clock um, in the morning after like, a bunch of beers, I said, you know, I'm, like, I'm okay talking about it. I just need more time to think about what I want to say on this on the subject, uh, which I really respected. Um, so you can play a game that, that to a lot of people might not feel like a really personal work, um, but to the people who make them, it's, it's so personal they almost can't really, it's almost a Voldemort thing, like a, saying the name of, of the thing that they're scratching at is. Um, so I know that entirely answers the question. So I love the, how personal that is inside to me it is objectively a better game, I think, uh, just because it builds it builds on that in such a beautiful a beautiful way. It's it's a little bit more specific, like it, there's more shape to it, um, and and yet it's still just as strange. It's not. It doesn't get so the limbo gets almost too involved, self involved with the pu with the puzzle, like with the puzzles, and I think that that pulls away from what the game wanted to be, which was more about the feeling of being in that place. And I think you lose some of that, that sense of, um, you almost get distracted from the yeah. environment um, because you're, just, you're trying to figure out how to get a box to float up to the ceiling and, and slide a certain way. Um, so it's, it's a tension between mechanics and theme, but um, one of my favorite uh, studios. RIP. And thanks for that. I'm gonna go back and play inside again just after that, I think. Um, yeah, I, that's, we could talk, we'll talk about it all. Yeah, um, three hours. <laughs> okay, uh, moving on, our uh, next uh, speaker um, is uh, from Vigit Games, Dominique Boutin. Hello everyone. So I'm talking about creating Star Trek Fleet Command in Dublin. Oh, I think I need to switch. Oh, yes, there you go. This one here? Yeah. Okay, cool. Aha, uh -huh. so um, I'm Dominique Boutin, or short Dom. I'm for six years now the CTO at Digital Game Studios. I'm doing free to play games, mostly very large projects for nine years now. And before that, I did 10 years of small to mid sized projects, mostly real time 3D as a programmer, but um, also as a technical artist. So 19 years now is, uh, in game tech and 31 years already programming. <laughs> so Digit, Digit is an Irish game dev studio. We are, um, our office is near Tower Station and Pier Station. Uh, we are now over 70 people. 50% of them are Irish and 50% from all over the world. Uh, many of whom we did relocate to Dublin. Richard was founded in 2012. These are the founders, Richard, Dave, and Kirk. So two Irish and one Englishman. And that means this year we are seven years old. And we did celebrate that, of course. So Richard is also about not only making games, but also being together 
and having a lot of fun. Um, so we went to um, zero latency, which is a new VR installation here in Dublin. If you have a chance to check it out, highly recommend it. Um, so, you know, all, our design team, for example, they play every week board games together. Uh, we have Nobilia, PlayStation, um, Thirsty Thursday. I guess we're in Ireland, so every Thursday um, we drink together and have some snacks. Um, so our first game, um, we created that as a venture capital backed startup. Um, it's, it was an MMO, it was our own IP. Uh, actually two books were written based on that IP and published and translated in, I don't know, four or five languages. Um, so Digit um, focused on one genre and tries to become better and better and better over time. So we focus on strategy games or empire builders. Um, so we usually innovate in graphics fidelity and some of the game mechanics. And with Kings of the Realm, we also innovated back then in uh, you know, 2012, 2013, 14, um, in accessibility. So we had one game world, but the client was running on five platforms and um, they were all connected to the same game world. So you could start playing in the web browser on your PC, then in the bus, <coughs> continue playing on your phone. And if you had a tablet at home on the couch, you could um, resume your session there. And back then, there were not many people believing that it was doable or made sense, but we did it and it uh, was quite cool. Here are a couple of screenshots. So we released Kings of the Realm um, in 2014. Uh, top left, you see like, which is typical, you have kind of like a settlement that you need to build up. Um, a lot of graphical details, 2D. Um, it was quite a challenge to make it work on iPad 2 that we had to support back then. Um, there's the world map, more like a tabletop graphics experience. Um, and then we had, so for example, one of the mechanics was how do you, you know, attack a city? How do you uh, go into the, the central keep? You could go through a district or you just went for a district and not for the central keep. Um, and it was mostly 2D, but we started to integrate some 3D elements. For example, you could craft from different materials, uh, three weapons, and then equip your army heroes with that. So then, on our second game, Star Trek Fleet Command, how did that happen? So there's a company in Los Angeles called Scopely, and there were several people in there that just loved King, our first game, Kings of the Realm, and they were playing that nonstop, um, day and night. Um, their portfolio was mostly uh, casual at that point, first steps into mid-core, to, um, yeah, mid and they had the desire to expand more into the mid to hardcore. Um, they also had actually access to the Star Trek IP um, and they reached out to us. And um, we visited them and it's true, I, I saw the guys working and our game was open then. They were just working and at the same time playing our first game. It's really nice to see. So Star Trek Fleet Command took three years to develop. Uh, we <coughs> released it in November 2018. Um, and it was beating all our expectations. So usually with these kind of games, what you do, you do kind of like a soft launch, which means you release it in some territory under a different name or something like this. And we were looking at the metrics, we're like, oh, are we measuring wrong? It doesn't seem right. Let's wait a month. So we wait a month, so the metrics are like, hmm, still wrong. <laughs> Can't be right, right? Let's wait another month. And then after three months, we're like, okay, let's go for a worldwide launch, which is quite a big thing. It's not serious. Um, marketing money behind this and it's also the reason why we, we partnered with Scopely because they were specializing in uh, publishing games. Um, so I'm not allowed to talk about numbers um, <laughs> <laughs> but there's third party companies that uh, do this research and try to figure out how much you make and so I took a screenshot here um, and so it's pretty amazing actually. So here's some in-game screenshots. Um, Top left again, like the settlement experience if you want, so you can build up your star base uh, based on the movies. Um, we have a new uh, mission system and dialogue system, which is interesting for the um, strategy and empire genre because we have something like dilemmas and dialogue choices. Usually you just click through it and here, but you need to make a choice. Do you support more the Orient guys, do you help them, or do you go um, against the Federation? Uh, and you get faction points uh, based on that or rewards. Um, we also have like over 700 solar systems that you can fly around. 
it's a free fall movement. Like before, it was more grid based. It's um, free fall, fall movement. And we have um, 3D characters based on the actor, which means we need to get approval uh, from either um, CBS, the agency, or the actor himself. And when the actor says, my nose is too long, or I don't look buff enough, <laughs> then we need to change it. <laughs> I'm pretty happy with that. Um, one amazing thing is because we do this MMO games, uh, we get a real MMO community sitting in here. So uh, these are screenshots from our game map where you fly around with the ships. When you zoom in, you kind of see the, the spaceships. You can zoom even further than that. When you zoom out, we kind of reduce it like a level of detail so you kind of see like a 2D representation there. And the players on different servers started to create all kind of shapes. Um, just last week um, on one of the servers, one of the player uh, went to hospital and had kind of like more difficult times. And they then decided to kind of create some shape there, some text. And it takes some serious effort to, you know, we can have up to three, four ships at max. So you need to coordinate um, with a lot, a lot of people and make the shape. Um, and it's actually really, really nice to see. And really rewarding because we worked on this game for three years. Um, and then when you release it and then you kind of get that feedback loop, um, um, we kind of like moved by it a lot. Um, free to play games uh, means it's um, games as a service or live ops, live operations, which means you need to create a living universe that changes constantly. We have different um, approaches um, on that. Uh, one of the kind of standard approaches is to have tournaments, um, leaderboard driven tournaments. Um, our system is quite powerful. We can give you points or reduce points on any activity in the game. Therefore, our live ops team can create all kind of new experiences or competitions inside the game. Or if you mine this kind of material, you get one point. If you mine that material, you get 10 points. If you win this battle, you get that. Um, and then we can um, change it all over the time and kind of keep it interesting for the players. We also do something which I would say is a little bit unusual, which we call expansion packs. And we did one uh, very recently, which we call the Khan, Khan expansion, where we injected a new set of solar systems, <coughs> as a character, new um, storyline with that, um, um, new ships. Um, yeah. So that's the live ops part. Uh, Digit invested already into um, in-house built live ops platform since the days of, I think, of the round, which means we have basically a content management system, a web base where we can edit everything. Here you kind of see like the uh, editor where we see all the solar systems and the connections with that. So you can zoom in, zoom out, click something in it, change it, save it, and then publish it to the game if you want. Um, so that's very, very powerful. It's basically editing the game in the web um, and doing changes quite fast like that. Also, I mean, a lot of games do it, but we, 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 ha we work with a lot of people that also worked in free to play games with a thousand people <laughs> and um, they all confirmed like the depth and polish that we have in our tools um, is quite unique and that all that has been programmed and developed here in Dublin. To make, um, to create um, Star Trek Fleet Command, um, we had to grow massively. Uh, Kings of the Ram was developed with a studio of 20, now we are over 70. When we started, we needed to ramp up really fast. So within six months, we doubled the company nearly. And within 12 months, we tripled. That's not necessarily very healthy. Um, has a lot of side effects, bringing so many people in in a short amount of time. And um, luckily, um, we have this mind mindset of the studio is a product as well as the game. So you kind of need to uh, consciously create and shape uh, shape and improve and iterate on, on both of that. Be really honest with yourself, um, take feedback from, from everyone and then take action to improve it. Mm, it's easier said than done, but um, sometimes people just say it or companies just say it and then there's not so much action in, uh, in it. But I believe that um, Digit truly did it and only that was the reason why we actually uh, managed to finish a Star Trek Fleet Command and digest this massive uh, growth that we did at the beginning. We developed a lot of internal tools. One of them you already saw, which was um, uh, the web panel, how we call it. 
uh, we have um, we use Unity for the client, um, and we have an in-house build farm that we build for it, including like a custom portal, so all the engineers can develop and submit uh, whatever they're working on, and it gets built in the in the background, and then they can uh, bring up their phone and just download it at any time. Um, that's saving a lot of time on the engineering side. Because a build like this can can take easily an hour because Unity is actually quite slow in building. Another pitfall we run into is Android and the heat that these devices create. When you look at the specs, you're like, oh, this is a really powerful device. This should run awesome graphics. Um, and then we did some tests and we realized, okay, 30% of our test run had 20 to, no, had 30 frames per second, but 70% had like 10 frames per second. What was going on? And one thing I didn't realize back then was how fast Android actually throttles down the CPU and GPU to uh, protect itself from overheating. Um, iOS is um, much more forgiving and much more tolerant to heat. <coughs> now on, on the Android side, it's developing like the recent models and new APIs that are coming out, but we had to invest a significant amount of time to optimize much, much further than we, we anticipated uh, for, for the Android platform. We created also all kind of custom um, native libraries to actually read on the device the temperature and the throttling values, and that helped us to get over that hill. Another pitfall that we hit into is um, Unity upgrades. Um, it took us six months to upgrade the project from um, going from Unity 5.3 to 5.6, and then again from 5.6 to 2018, um, also six months. And the reason for that is that um, Unity Engine, of course, has bugs, and as they evolve, they create new bugs. So um, we actually pay them to fix their bugs. <coughs> so we use the commercial support that they have, and it's not necessarily cheap, and it takes a lot of time. We give them something, they fix it, then they need to um, wind up in the official uh, release version, and then you uh, find out that they broke something else, and then you repeat. So that's where the little six months come from, just repeating, repeating until it's stable enough so you can move the entire project without any blockers. So how do we move forward? Uh, we have three key pillars, um, how we define our roadmap. One is um, new game features, the other one is live ops, explain all about this, and the other one is tech and, and tools to keep up with the velocity and, and what we do. So that was pretty much it. I hope that gave you a little window in what we did in the last years. Um, the thing that sucks a little bit when you work on these kind of projects is for three years we are not allowed to talk about it. You know, we were not allowed to talk to say that we work on Star Trek, we couldn't really share any <coughs> things that we did because out of context it doesn't really make much sense. But since, since the release we try to be more open and reaching out and sharing more. Um, so feel free to reach out to me or anybody else from Digit if you have any questions. And um, we did more talks in the past and there will be more in the future. Thank you. Uh, again, Dominique, uh, if, you're, if you're allowed to talk about it, sure. um, just while I do the changeover. Oh, yeah. we're going to the panel now, actually. Is, uh, obviously, there was a big announcement yesterday yeah. um, that Scopey did by Digit. Correct. So yes. congratulations. Thank you. Um, just, you know, how, how, how does something like that change a company? Or what, what's going to change... Or what does that allow? Does it mo mean yeah. sort of investment in more, more games or what? It's a very, very good question. Normally, um, acquisitions have the risk that it changed the company, right? Um, now, we worked with Scopey with several years, and we now understand them really well. And we also actually partnered with Scopey because they, are not, they were not that big at the beginning. So they were ambitious, yeah. but uh, it was not like Star Trek Fleet Command would be a project that you can just cancel really fast because it's just one of your line items. If you're EA or Tencent, you have kind of like a lot of projects, so canceling one just doesn't matter so much. So in this case, um, we are on the same page. So Scopely is interested in keeping the culture of digit that made digit successful and improving it further. So for us, it actually means we have more resources, more funding, and can actually um, do more things that we want to do to become more successful. So we're taking off some of the breaks that we had before because you know when you have a, a monthly burn rate, 
and you don't want to go above that, now you can say, you know what, it makes sense to invest that as a bigger amount of money, but let's do it. So it's actually a bit hard to believe again that that happened. It's in one of those unique um, situations where, I mean, we had uh, yesterday the co-CEO there and everything that he said totally aligns with how we think about it. So it doesn't really mean yeah. much change except things are going to be better and we're going to stay around for a long, long time. Okay, that's great. <laughs> Phil is one question actually. I mean, Digit has been has been the flag bearer for for games in Ireland for a long time, and the three guys deserve a lot of credit. As do all of the staff, and uh, we've a lot of our graduates and and students who are, who are working there um, from the start as well. Yeah. So you know, um, it, it's it's a great success story for yourselves in Irish game uh, games. And thanks for coming along tonight. Thank yeah, you. Well, and Phil, you have a question. Yeah. say so hardware level if you so platforms are always restricted and unity itself is a restricted platform right it's not like an open source engine where you can change everything so having the mindset to design or develop under constraints and understanding what kind of supports you go into is I think really useful so anything that you can pick up because mobile is like the platform that has the most access and most availability so if you like let's VR sets for example there is not that much of a mark um, thing so Having knowledge in that area will be always beneficial. Is that like a must have? I don't think so. I think a must have is do a project and complete it. Don't be afraid from challenges and fight through it because most of that is actually the challenges and having the grit to fight through it. So for example, when we hire, especially young, young people, what I'm looking at is mostly what of kind of projects they worked on and what did they do? What is the hands-on experience? So experience in creating a project, contributing to it, and doing something special, somewhere. You know, this small thing doesn't need to be classic, fancy, but it's um, Um, moving on, we've got our, our um, inner panel discussion, and I'm going to introduce you to the person leading it and the, the topic that you're going to be talking about, uh, list, uh, uh, engaging with today. And there will be time for questions at the end. Um, uh, Elaine Reynolds from Tim Tracker. Hi, everyone. Please introduce you next. Um, hope people are really enjoying it so far. Um, before we start, so this is the inner uh, game makers panel. I just want to announce uh, before I forget. Um, applications are open, submissions are open at the moment for the Immers Game Awards. So if you have a game that you released last year, so in 2018, um, enter it in the awards. Um, we, if you remember, you have got the email. Um, we'll be putting details up on Facebook. If you um, rejoin or, or join Immers, you'll get details. So there's all sorts of categories like narrative, analog, any game you've released um, will be eligible for at least one of the categories. So please enter. It's, uh, it's a really nice thing to get. It's a nice um, always nice to say your game is an award and there's some nice trophies um, as well. So definitely uh, look out for that. 
Um, so for the panel, um, yeah, I put a poll up on Facebook, in the Irish Game Day Facebook group, asking um, what people wanted to hear about. And there were two tied topics, so career paths and setting up a game studio. So if we're going to try between us in 20 minutes to cover everything you need to know about uh, both those topics. Uh, just before we start, can we get a quick show of hands in the audience? How many people are students? Okay, cool. And then a lot of people, a lot of finger face, a lot of people already uh, working in the industry. Um, great, so yeah, I'll let everyone um, introduce themselves and talk a little bit about their own career paths and their own uh, studios. So okay, John? so uh, I'm John Howard. Um, my career paths and what I've done, uh, I started uh, DCU and then I went to Scotland to do a master's in computer games. Uh, ended up in a small game studio there, which was my first break into game development. Um, so I ended up in mobile games. My idea was to do AAA uh, kind of physics, uh, working in a big company in the UK, move over there. I ended up in a small game studio in Dundee, uh, working on mobile games for the first time. And then after that, I have never really left mobile games. And after that, I ended up in Dublin and kind of fell into pop cap games for seven years and moved into various roles in there. One of them uh, moved at the end towards engineering manager there for the game studio. Um, and then after that, I uh, set up a game company called Six Minute, um, which we had going for uh, group of 10 people. And we had uh, uh, four years, I think we had it going. And uh, since then, we set up a new company called Call Team, uh, which I'm currently working on with. Or uh, three other people, so that's pretty much me. Hi, uh, I'm Peter from Fierce Fun. Uh, I hope I hope I'm going to have the most unusual career path in, in games. So I started out in banking. I spent ten years in banking, <laughs> and I ended up in games. It's a long story, but the short version is um, uh, I worked as a project manager uh, in in the bank. And if anybody knew the Ludo computer games course by Fermat uh, way back, uh, I set that up. Well. Um, basically, I got, I got into computer games through uh, setting up that course, and from that then I ended up working with uh, a company called VU Games, which is now Activision Blizzard, and they were expanding in Dublin, their localization group, which they're still there, and so that was a great experience, basically worked with the likes of Valve and Blizzard and Company Sierra as well, other companies like that. Um, after that then, uh, working with a lot of American game developers, I said, hey, you know, we can make a game as well. And so, so I set up a studio, a studio in Ireland called Airplay. And we had a good run for a few years, but we made the early Java mobile games. I don't know if anybody played those. Uh, you know, we made, we did okay. I was telling somebody we had 100,000 downloads in China and India. At the time, I think we made two euro from it. Just <laughs> terrible numbers, <laughs> you know. So I learned, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so I learned a lot from that, but basically uh, we ended up making games for other people. Uh, I left the industry for a while, which in my experience is a good thing to do, and I've come back recently, uh, I set up Fierce Fun, and we make um, free-to-play uh, mobile games, and we're probably going to start on PC games soon, so yeah, that's all. My name is Callum Larkin, um, I studied pro uh, computer science in Trinity. 20 years ago now. Um, for a long time, worked in non-games, worked in tech, tech startups, web dev, um, mobile startups as well. But never ever games, even though it's something I was really interested in. I didn't know, when I went to college, there were no games courses. And when I came out of college, there didn't seem to be any games jobs in Ireland, at least. Um, in 2014, I gave up my, my tech job to set up my own games company, which is called Gambler. Um, and just briefly, yeah, me, I also did masters in Dundee in game technology and then worked as a programmer um, at, line, at um, Travis Tales and then as a game designer at Lionhead and then went back to Dublin to set up Sim Interactive and we make uh, free to play mobile games. Um, but I'm going to talk about like getting a start in the industry. So my, my first job was actually a job as a game designer stroke scripter at a company in Milton Keynes and the day before. I was going to get the ferry to move over to Milton Keynes. I got a phone call saying it had been put on hold. And basically, I found out two weeks later they were cancelling the project and laying off half their staff. So that was a real um, 
good introduction to the in games industry in the sense that that's the reality for, for a lot of it. And then Micah's job was, um, it, I never actually applied for it. It was the recruitment company were looking to fill roles and they said, oh, we sent <coughs> off your, your CV and oh, they want to interview you. So I said, oh, might, might as well go for it. So I kind of, kind of fell into, into it that way. Um, what about, uh, anyone want to share their story of how they got their start? Yeah, I can share. Yeah, I got, um, it was a fairly random kind of job that I got in Dundee. Uh, someone heard about me. I was, I was kind of going around the UK looking for a job, actually. And, but my girlfriend still lives <coughs> in Dundee, and someone heard about me, and it's like, I'd never heard about this games company, and it was a pretty weird job. And this guy met me, and it was a very small studio. He used to pay me cash. Sometimes it would come late, and it was very <laughs> dodgy. Um, I didn't really know much about anything. Uh, what they asked me to do, but basically they had a game that didn't work <coughs> on the device that they were told to get it working on for the publisher, and I, I went in and within a few months I'd rewritten the game and made it work on that device, and hey presto, I kind of got my first experience, and then I got a proper job pretty quick after that because I went over to the games company in Dublin and told them all the stuff that I'd done to fix this game for this company and how they'd done it, and they said, okay, here you go, straight away, get the job, so that was kind of my break, was taking this weird job and this personal reasons in this kind of dodgy company um, and yeah that got me a kind of proper job that was my kind of big in there. Yeah I, I, when I joined a particular company a BU Games uh, when, I, when I, how I got in there was it was a friend of mine in there and I, one piece of advice I give to everybody is you know it's really hard if you know people <coughs> in there or you can contact them or go to events like this or talk to somebody games companies are very kind of insular and, and we tend to hire people we know, uh, and I think a lot of companies do. Um, so I, somebody there knew me, and I said, look, there's a job coming up. Uh, and that, I see that an awful lot. So that's, that's basically what, how, how I get in. So definitely, yeah, if you don't like networking, yeah, I, I, I don't know, you know it's, it is kind of important in games uh, in, in the community, I would say. Um, there's a lot of students here, right? Um, you're probably looking at jobs and job um, postings. Do you see a lot of jobs that say they need experience and not many that are graduate? Mm -hmm. Is that true? Mm -hmm. So how do you get your first job? I think that's a really good thing to talk about. Yeah. And I, I hire sometimes. Yeah. My first job wasn't in games, it's so long ago, I can't even remember. <laughs> but um, I hire, and when I'm looking at people, if you have no job experience, that can still be fine. And the best thing I want to look at then portfolio of things you've made in your time in university. So make, make things, small things, broken things, that's fine. But sh have something that you can show and that's as valuable as, as direct work experience. And you can do that as part of your studies, right? Yeah, and, and I'd add to that as well, that when you're, you're studying, you might be at the top of your class and obviously Technical University of Dublin has very, very high standards. So I'm talking about other colleges, you might be at the top of your class, but that doesn't necessarily mean you'll get a job, you're not trying, your goal isn't to get um, the highest grade or to be the top of your class, your goal is to get a job and to learn what you need to learn. So um, you might you know, do a project that gets you a high enough score, but it mightn't be good enough when you're you know, applying, competing against people all around the world. So yeah, I'd agree with that, to put a lot of effort into the projects and into developing your skills and showing off your skills in a way that someone can easily see in, in a project. And I think that's really useful. We, we actually have a TU Dublin, is the idea? TU Dublin, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 says uh, we, we, we have a graduate working with us, and we've had two internships. And uh, how they get in, and this is kind of what the other thing is, they just pester us and pester us <laughs> and, and will come up to me and pester us. Uh, and, you know, you need that kind of resilience to work in it, because it, it is very competitive. And, you know, the industry here is still small. so. That's one thing, again, I would say is, is um, uh, you know, definitely perseverance um, is, is one thing. And you know, just, again, the two people in particular, they just kept at us and kept talking to us at different events. And we, you know, it's just, you just hired them, it's easier than having this happen, you know? So, but do, you know, do that. And, and it, you, you, you kind of, you, you do get more of it. So, yeah, yeah, you will. I guess a side version of that is try and meet people in games companies you're interested in. So if you see they're speaking of something, you can't say hello to them afterwards. Okay. 
I think it's also useful the, ro the role of work experience and internships. So I did um, an internship at a games company in Galway that made me realise I needed to do a masters, and I did two weeks work experience um, at Lionhead uh, about two years before I actually applied for the role. And I do think that helped, if only because the when people hiring me had sat beside me for for two weeks, I knew I, I wasn't crazy basically. So I think that was like uh, that, that that was that, that was something. Uh, that even just like being being a bit familiar kind of helps, um, and as well I think getting your foot in the door is uh, is really good as well, especially for I think roles like being a producer or being a game designer, where I think I think it is harder to sort of evaluate those skills compared to say an artist or a programmer. But when they see if if you let's say um, let's say you want to be a producer, but you start as you and your tester, if you do really well and if they see okay this person has the aptitude, they're willing to learn. They've, they've really got the skills, then there's like a really good opportunity to move into a producing role and to, to move up the, the chain that way. Um, do, you, do you get it? So you were an engineering manager, was it? Yep. Yeah. So do you have advice for people who want to um, basically get, get promotions and move their, move their career up? Um, for when you're in a company, how to get yeah, promoted and yeah. move up. Um, I think it's, it's Professionalism is the main thing that I found that help that helps a lot. Like with, with promotion stuff, like um, if I want if I were to work with a teammate, it's like pa like I want them to be passionate and I want them to to have all their talent and stuff like that. But it's professionalism and stuff. I think that's a good key component. I think that people sometimes uh, overlook. Um, what do you mean by professionalism? So it's kind of like always on. You know, you're always in. You're always you know together. Various aspects outside of your scope, and um, I think that's the best way to kind of move forward. If you if you like, if if that's what you want, you've got to you've got to become that kind of professional. When people see you as that dependable, really uh, solid person who can help, you know, lots of people do different things. Then that's for me is, I think, how I've seen people move forward. And myself, and that's what happened for me. Anyway. Maybe add to that, like people are willing to go beyond their specific job role. Yeah. They're willing to learn things they're not maybe ready to do yet, but willing to help. I mean, a lot of games, like games are really, you know, mostly um, needed to work with mostly like in, um, specialization of care. So if you need help doing something, someone's just volunteered to try and figure that out for you, that's yeah. a good talent, I think. So willing to try things, willing to help, not just have one role in the company. So yeah. that's something I like. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Uh, if you're applying to companies that are startups or small, um, and having worked in a large game publisher and, and now in a small one, the, the larger it is, the more specialised role, and probably the more experience you need. Where not not always, but so with a smaller company, we are looking for more all-rounders. Uh, so exactly that, if, if they can do that. Uh, and the other big piece of advice is, you know, don't um, you know pick the games company now and go on gamers <coughs> list and just send your CV to the the one with the one letter uh, again related to you know if you're looking at what we do compared to some of the other companies it's, it's a bit different so if you tailor it to because we might do you know mobile and HTML5 games then you might mention and some and you might mention your CV it could be picked up or you know I, I, I know a JavaScript library as well as Unity as well as something else and that really stands out so you read the show you look you look at what we do so, like, absolutely, if you're going to send the one letter and the one CV to, like, you know, 20 companies, uh, it could be very difficult. So definitely, if you can tailor it, you know, do a bit of research on the company, it makes, makes a difference. And then for people who are thinking of setting up their own uh, game studios, um, what advice do you have, Colin? We'll start, we'll start with you. Um, know, know what you're going to make. So you can, you can start now. You probably have in college or anyone who's... Um, full-time in another industry or um, a part-time amateur game creator. You're already making things, so you need to know what your product is going to be. It's pretty rare, I think, to set up a company and then all you know, look at each other and think about what, what we make. <laughs> so you, you can start making a game now, and you can form a company around that when you need to. Um, so definitely know exactly what you're making, your first product, your first game. Can I ask you just a comment, and I think if we could just take a few questions from the floor. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
just <coughs> having been involved in a few startups way back in the day, um, 20 years ago, um, there's some pitfalls that people aren't kind of often aware of when they're setting up a company. They get caught into the idea, they're all working together, they're all passionate about it. What, what are the things that people to watch out for when you know, you're getting to that commercial stage where you might actually start making money, you know? So, an easy one is you form a company with your friends, so it's informal. Um, you should have a talk early on and then commit in writing. It doesn't need to be a formal contract yet. Even an email that you've all agreed on saying, this is how, what our shares are, or our, our agreement is, this is how it's going to work until we all agree to change things, saying we all own part of the company today. But also, what happens if someone leaves? You need to do that even at an informal level, very early, because it happens a lot, and it causes <coughs> that tears apart startups when, if you haven't had, a, had that talk and put it down in writing somewhere. Uh, when you make a real company, you probably need to get a lawyer to draft it. <laughs> Great, so yeah, any, any questions uh, from the audience? I do need one to get started. <laughs> yeah. Like, do you think it would be uh, detrimental to open your own games company too soon after college? Or do you think you should go into the industry? I don't think so. Um, anyone know Pewter Game here? Little, little Acre? I think they were straight out, they still start it straight out of college. Um, they've got a successful company now. Um, what, what you can gain out of you know working for other companies or even other industries that certainly both of us have is some you know perspective and long-term experience um, it'll probably help you run a company so there's absolutely nothing stopping you there's no real there's no specific gotcha about being too soon out of, out of college no yeah it's kind of it, it's it's like half and half like you, there's a lot to, to be gained by doing it later when you've got all this experience and you've got it cool head on your shoulders, but then also you, you, I know most of my personal experience people who've been super successful at doing a, a company have all done it very young. Um, so like my logic for what my head would say is like, well, you're better off with experience, but what I've seen in practice is like if that founder of PopCap was 20, like he's made the drink when he set up PopCap and then he sold it when he was 34 for a few hundred million. So one good advantage is it's easier to be risky yeah, you probably don't have a family to support yet. Yeah. Yeah. If, if, if you can live like a student while starting a company, that's great. <laughs> There's two ways to make the game you want to make. One is to be poor, and the other is to be rich. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing, is really hard. The other thing <laughs> young people have been finishing at university is they have insights into things that someone in their mid to late 30s like me, who doesn't, doesn't have that. I'm trying to figure out what certain demographics are into for you guys you know it, you're living it, so you should have insights so that's your key strength, as well as the fact that you can work longer hours and do crazy things like that, and you own families and stuff, and that's your other strength, but your key strength is your insight into what that, that people, young people are into. Okay, well, we, we are, of course, supporting you having families at some point. <laughs> <laughs> that's it, for sure. Yeah. But the thing is, if you get a job, um, rather than setting up your own company, you're being paid to make mistakes and learn yeah. by someone mm -hmm. else, and you get to learn from other people you so but I also agree with yeah what, what John said that you see some people are really successful when they when they set up early. Uh, so another question yeah. Uh, if you're starting up a company, your own company, what would be better it's probably an easier question. Um, what would be better starting off with a game that's you 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 pay to get or a free to play game so that you tease the customer into saying this is what we make and you tweak it at the moment, but then maybe our next game may be paying, or what would be better for uh, your so company? Are you asking is it free to play or pay to play? Well, yeah, but what would be better for the company when you're starting off? I think it depends on what kind of company you want to set up, and I think as well as what, to add to what Colin said about deciding what game, I think it's also decide what company, and you know the, the free to play pay question, I think also depends a lot on the genre and the platform. So I think it needs to be considered holistically. I don't think there's one. There's, there's markets, you know, the same way that there's mar there's a console market, there's a mobile market. There's a market for paid games. There's a market for free-to-play games. So I would, yeah, consider all the different factors when you're. I think you need to put a value on it. Though. Well, a, a separate answer to that, I think, is it's worth considering what you're making and, and trying to figure out is, is there a market for this? Can can this sustain a business, 
or is this a fun game that probably maybe doesn't have a, a way to make money? Um, the sort of free to play games make lots of money. Um, don't like don't forget that. It's just a different way of getting it. Um, yeah, just to, just a, I have a kind of a, a learning curve having created a free to play. Like it's easier to make a paid game. I haven't done both. Like free to play now, you know, you need new content. You need lots of other services added to into it, like small teams. I don't know how small teams make proper free to play games. Because think about it, you need constant new content coming out. So if you're two people, how, even if you use some services. So yet, if you're very small, I'd probably go with it. It's literally easier to design and, and from more from a design perspective. But doing a proper free to play game that you want to make money on is a complex thing. You know, you really got to think this game, because this game could be out in the market and cost me money, which it will, uh, and you might be making money. So, I, again, if you're starting out, I'd probably try, you know, a PC game on Steam and just see, get a, you know, probably get it on paper. Probably. Great, another question? Uh, yeah, Tim, can you go back? Uh, in terms of when you start up a company, let's say straight up out of college, is it important to um, nail down specific brands so in terms of like name and logo or would it be like worth doing that after you have a game and have a game logo and win in the end? You, you need a name yeah. and you need a logo. I mean, when you launch games, it's not the end of the world. Don't overthink it. Yeah. Um, try and find one that's unique and get it. You should have a web presence. Um, but it's not, it's not the most important thing. Um, when we made our first game, our, you know, our biggest challenge was to try and get people to know about our game. Mm. Now that we're making a new game, we have a side challenge, which is trying to get people to come down to our studio. So that's sort of long term. But if, if you don't reach that point, that doesn't matter. Yeah. So for our first game, no one knew about it. It did also didn't matter because no one knew about our studio. So the name isn't really that important. But it is fun if you think of. I, I certainly <laughs> did spend a lot of time on it <laughs> when I started. <laughs> Maybe an RPG character. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and then beside you, that's um, do any, ha yeah, any of you have any thoughts on the rising interest in unionization in the games industry? <laughs> <laughs> as, as we're on the evil capitalist side. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but I think it's great. Um, I have a real problem with like forced overtime, which is really common in games. Um, and I think it's just a bad idea. So if it goes away, I think we'll actually gain out of it. Um, anyone else have thoughts? Or have you Pro thought? Probably, definitely, I think of when I, now a long, long time ago, you know, with a large publisher, yeah, I mean, it was. Um, no, it should be like any other industry. I mean, I, I, I don't see, I think, it's, I think it's a positive thing. Um, but it depends on the company size as well. Uh, say if it's your company, but no, I, I think it's a good thing. Why not? I, yeah, I haven't seen a lot of thought, but I think it's good. I mean, I'm against overtime in general. Um, and I think also I think the labor laws here are a lot better, a lot more um, protective for employees than say in, in America, so yeah. There's already some rights you get yeah. just by working yeah. for someone here in Ireland, which is good. Yeah. Okay. Some questions, yeah. Uh, okay, one more. One more. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how do you go about getting like an initial debt investment? You know, like how do you prove whether you think it's viable to like build like part time or just setting up for your own company? Well, well a, uh, there's a number of places you can go on Enterprise Ireland, the local enterprise board, are the, and a number of game companies we have have got funding from them. Uh, you need to have somebody in your team who's done a business plan and have, you know, think of it as a games business rather than just making a game. But there are still, they do fund. Uh, so the local enterprise board and uh, Enterprise Ireland, um, yeah, they talk to a potential. Uh, and if you've I mean, the big thing I'd say to anybody, even if you have a small audience of people interested in your demo or something, you want to show up, they're, they're the two to, to look at. To look up. Another thing as well that, um, that I didn't know did as well is, is New Frontiers. So it's um, an entrepreneur development program where it runs for six months. They look for a full-time commitment. <coughs> so it might, it, it might suit some people. To, it might be a, a wise decision for some people to have a job and, and work part-time. But if you do want to take six months and, and work Full time, then they give you support and mentorship and classes, and also a grant of um, I think fifteen thousand euros. So that's something as well 
as like a, an initial um, start. And then to, to apply to that, you need to, there's an application form, so you need to have, yeah, done, it's not a full business plan, but to have given some thought to, to the business side of things as well. But doing that kind of business plan is actually good practice for you. So even if you try and submit for something like that, we produce the book. What you have to give them is actually good practice for you to really think about, well, what is our target market? Why is what we're making interesting? Right? Okay, you was kicking us off the stage. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> panels that we could go on you could see this could go on for quite a bit and people are starting to get a bit more confident about putting their hand up so i apologize for putting short um but um we are going to move on speaker for tonight, uh, who's come all the way from far flung uh, London. Um, so Emily Short. Um. with people who may go on to do awesome things later on. So that's kind of a specific direction that, that really worked out for me, even though that kind of wasn't um, why I got into it in the first place. All right, so uh, if we're talking about mysterious and alluring problems, first I'm going to spend some time talking about things that are not mysterious and alluring problems. 
Um, so things that are not so mysterious. There are lots of things in narrative design that we have more or less learned how to do at a high level. Um, so things like mapping a story to a physical space, things like gating content based on puzzles and challenges is a particularly awesome um, uh, puzzle structure chart uh, from Div Tensibo, which is totally worth looking at. Um, we talk a lot about how to communicate a message to players via your narrative structure, um, having a story that branches only a little bit and, and punishes you with death every time you stray off the successful path is telling the player something very different about their experience than a looping game system where you're revisiting the same kinds of situations over and over again. Those are very different kinds of experiences. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about how to avoid combinatorial explosion, how to keep the branching um, and the development of your plot in line. We talk about how to write choices with the right number of branches to be fun. You might say, well, we've got one option because I want the player to feel completely constrained, um, two options, three options, and so on. Um, and there, you know, we can kind of rule out some of these as being not the best fit in most situations. Um, there are actually talks on the GDC vault that make the argument that you should always have exactly three options, um, and that this is a solved problem. Um, I think that's slightly overkill, but uh, there are people with strong opinions who have talked about this a lot, um, as well as things like uh, how do we pace content? When you've got an interactive story, it's always a challenge to control um, how, like how rapidly the player is experiencing particular things, when they feel tension, when they feel relief, those kinds of problems. Um, how we offer choices that are morally or emotionally challenging. Um, I'm talking slightly more quickly than I normally would because time is a little condensed, so I'm happy to follow up and dig into some of this stuff more uh, afterwards if people are curious. Um, giving the player an experience either of power or of powerlessness is something that we talk about a lot. There's a lot of articles about what's involved in that, a really good GDC talk. Um, by Meg Jayanth about 80 Days from Inkle, which is a story about sort of moving through the world but not actually being able to fix all the problems that you encounter there, um, and the comment that that is on colonialism. So there's, there's some sort of deep thinking about some of these issues. Um, how do we characterize the protagonist, or on the other hand, let the player do the definition of that protagonist? Um, so all of these kinds of problems, if you're sitting here thinking like, okay, like she's telling me I'm supposed to already know all of this and I don't, that's alarming, don't worry about it. That's not really the point. There are lots, my point is that these are problems that we have already named. We've already identified them. And there are a lot of people who have talked about them and built kind of the groundwork up to dig into those issues. So as you encounter those problems in specific games, that doesn't mean that somebody has already solved how to, solve, how to fix this issue in the specific game that you're writing, and that is always a new discovery and a new process, but there's lots of discussion, there are techniques, there's craft um, that people know about, and so those are resources that are out there, and in fact, there's a lot of stuff on my blog about exactly this kind of stuff, so um, I'll put the URL for that at the end. Um, so those are not mysterious because they're named and identified. Um, then there are the, the set of problems that are not so alluring. Um, these are the problems that aren't mysterious um, necessarily, but they're also things where, as a game writer, when you're asked to solve these problems, um, it often makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable. Um, so what I mean by this, how do we um, give the player games that will elicit information about them, which we're going to collect into our vast store of player analysis data because I, a large company, am actually motivated to find things out about the player. And I don't care about the game design. Really, what I'm looking for is profiling. A little bit creepy. Um, I, okay, so this slide, I totally have to apologize for because of the number of people who are in free play. Um, and I need to kind of, um, <laughs> uh, I, I, there's actually a follow-up slide later on that, that sort of readdresses this point. Um, but I was feeling more and more guilty about having put this uh, tagline on this slide as I was listening to the other speaker. So apologies for that. Um, but the issue with building free-to-play narrative games specifically, especially choice-based games, is that that tends to create these drivers for how you design the choice space, how you design the story space, 
in order to create a compulsion for people to spend their coins in your game. So you get these choices um, from I mean, this is the game choices, um, where you've got two options that are really bland and boring and are not you know, good choices. I, I only want to say goodbye, or I've got nothing to say, um, or if I pay 12 gems, yeah, I want to get something off my chest. Um, which I feel is a weird thing to do to the player, especially in games that are targeted to young women. And so what we're saying to them is, in order to have a voice in this scenario, in order to speak for yourself, um, you're going to have to pay the game something. Which, it, it's just, it's a very uncomfortable kind of connection of capitalism and built-in structures of oppression, which, I, you know, that's a whole other talk in itself. And it gets even more exciting with this one, where um, if you want to have any uh, sexual agency in a situation, that will cost you 20 gems. <laughs> So it's hard not to feel a little bit strange um, as a narrative designer when you're being asked to write for these systems and solve the problem where the problem is get the player to pay in order to unlock part of the story. Um, and then add virality, by reality, make a game where the player has to tweet about my brand in order to play. Um, I did work on a project like this. I've intentionally not shown it. Um, I already helped them get enough exposure and we're done with that. Um, the, <laughs> the, these things are things that kind of, you know, they're driving the design process, they're putting pressures on what you can and can't do, but they tend to be not, you know, if, if you got into games from a business perspective, that might be one thing, and you might actually find these kinds of problems interesting to solve. They're interesting marketing problems, but they're not necessarily interesting narrative design problems, and they may be kind of shifting um, what you're trying to do in a worrying direction or supporting something that's not actually what you want to accomplish with your story. Um, especially if the reason that you got into games and interactive story in the first place is because you wanted to express something that was personal or true to yourself or accurate about the world. Having those kinds of pressures on it can feel very distorting. Somewhat less sinister, and I would say that because I've written for this company, um, but still a pressure that comes from the business side is we need lots and lots of episodic content, and so we're going to need to strategize. Fall in London has been running for, uh, I should have looked this up, but it's something like a decade now. So people have been continuously playing this game and getting new content out of this game on pretty much a monthly basis. And when you think about like what is required to make a game universe in which that continues to be compelling and continues to be a source of stories over that much time. That is an interesting problem, but when you approach it from the, from the marketing side, um, it can be a little bit sort of disorienting for, for narrative designers. Um, and then there are a few things in the space that I would say might be a bit mysterious, might be alluring, but are not necessarily narrative design problems per se anymore. Um, and this is actually where I put um, a lot of the things that I'm currently working on in the AI space. So the reason that I got sort of pulled from game writing into game AI is because there are experiences that I want to be able to create for players, especially around really powerful narrative agency, where I want things that you're doing throughout the course of play to have small and large perceivable consequences throughout the rest of what's going on. And what I found as a creator was you can pour lots and lots of content into your project and still just never be able to write enough elements to get the level of narrative agency that you're going for. And so that's the point at which we start to need um, kind of these additional abilities um, to actually create those experiences. So I was just going to show uh, sort of a very brief clip and intentionally not with audio, but this is one of the um, sort of demo from uh, the project character engine that I'm working on, where you have a character who's actually deciding what to say from moment to moment on the basis of what she's understanding from you, what her emotional state is, what her past relationship with you is. So this is taking some things from the narrative design space, but it's actually applying tech in order to help solve something that is kind of expanded beyond um, a straightforwardly designed problem. All right, so what does that leave us in the mysterious and alluring category? Um, and I'm going to pause dramatically because I'm thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> All right, <coughs> so mysterious and alluring narrative design problems are the ones that we haven't solved 
and maybe even haven't figured out how to talk about beyond the most basic conversations, and which are focused on the possibility space of the art form and the possibility to do good work with that form, whether that's work of self-expression, whether it's work of communicating important things about the world. Um, and in fact, uh, some of these problems are actually uh, mysterious and alluring forms of the less alluring problems we just saw. What do I mean by that? Um, if you look at this problem as I need to make a lot of episodic content because I need to keep my players coming back because if I don't do that, then the company is going to fold. That shapes things as a business problem and it tends to prioritize certain kinds of solutions and some of those solutions might or might not be the right one. If we restructure that as a narrative design problem, how do we build a story space that has really long-term consequences for what you're doing? How do we build up the player's sense that what they did back at the beginning of the game is still mattering after years of play? That becomes a genuine narrative design problem. It becomes an interesting one. It becomes one that we can think about um, how are we structuring our stories, our underlying systems, in order to be able to serve that? How do we do the task of reminding the player what they did? If I played something six years ago and made a decision that was important to me at the time, am I going to remember that later? Is it possible to call back to it? So how do we even think about that kind of thing if we think about it as long-term consequence? Uh, and similarly, although I think this particular set of choices is an alarming example, I think the problem of how do we do choices that have real world consequences and make that interesting, I think that is an interesting and narrative design problem. So saying, all right, when you attach prices to things, you're moving out of that sort of magic circle space in which nothing the player does is going to affect their real life because you're affecting their bank account. But that kind of question of, more broadly, what does this design space mean? What does it mean to work in a space where some of the options that the player is choosing are going to have effects beyond that particular moment? And how do you kind of play with the push-pull of their desire to do a particular thing um, versus their unwillingness to have that, uh, the effects happen in the real world? How do you balance, what kind of rhetoric emerges from that? And you potentially, if you think about that design space, you start to discover possibilities like, what if instead of having to pay gems, um, I were um, having certain choices result in donations being given to a cause? Would I be less willing to pick a choice that was going to donate to a cause that I disapproved of? Like, what kinds of dynamics emerge there? And that might not be a usable um, thing to explore for a free-to-play game, but it's a really interesting space that we haven't um, thought about nearly as much as might be interesting. Uh, and similarly, getting into um, how do we solve the virality problem, how do we give players enough creative ownership of what they've done in their game that they have something that they want to put on social media, something that they want to share. There are people who have written up these incredibly long, detailed blog posts about what they did in The Sims or what, they, what happened to them in Dwarf Fortress and how all of their dwarves died this time. Um, and it's not because nobody else's dwarves died, right? Like, that is what happens in Dwarf Fortress. But the question is, like, how did that happen specifically to you? And you care about it. You build your own story around it. So this kind of question of how do we admit players um, into co-creation in the game um, is a really interesting design space as well. And it's actually even one of my favorite um, parts of this design space. And it's the solution that I tried to apply in the case where I was asked to uh, make something that would make people tweet. Um, and it worked reasonably well. And so I wrote a blog post about what I had done and how it was uh, cool and interesting. Uh, and the first comment I got was somebody saying, I'm really disgusted. You're usually so honest on your blog, but here you're pretending that this obvious piece of advertising was a design discovery. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, cool. So I took the blog post down because I felt, you know, a little attacked. Um, but um, so, so I think there's, there's sort of a, an interesting um, surrounding uh, set of issues around how certain choices are even perceived on the basis of uh, the commercial environment in which they occur. But this still is a really interesting space and can be applied in lots of different ways. Um, and for those who are not familiar with it, um, this particular piece is um, Elegy for a Dead Planet, 
where you move through these gorgeous sort of science fictional spaces, and then you annotate them yourself with your own text, and then you can share the text that you've created on those slides with other players. So you're kind of, you're taking the prompt that has been provided by the artist, and you're layering it over with your own storytelling and sharing that with other people. Uh, so one of the other things that I think is, is an amazing and thoroughly underexplored space is the problem of multiplayer agency. So there are a lot of um, things that try to be multiplayer narrative pieces. So I'm not simply talking about uh, it's an MMO and we're going to go in and, and um, get through these dungeons together. I'm thinking of things that are attempting to be actually primarily narrative experiences that have shared choice. And a lot of the time, what people tend to do is kind of the, the first um, design instinct that they have um, is to put it to a vote and say, all right, I'm gonna have this room full of people, we're all going to play a narrative game together and you guys are gonna vote on what you wanna happen. And in practice, that tends not to be a very compelling experience because you have diluted the player's actual agency because it's quite likely that you'll be outvoted a good number of times in the interaction. Um, and you've lost what's actually interesting about voting in the real world, which is that people talk to each other before they vote. Um, and there's this interesting kind of you know, communal emergence of decision making. Um, and instead, you get something that tends to be kind of deadened as a gameplay experience. So how do we solve that? Well, there's you know, one solution is to say, actually, there's no um, inherent narrative that we've written. We're just going to let people interact, and stories will emerge from that, which is the Eve solution. And results have been fairly amazing. But I, I think there is also really interesting and underexplored design space in the question of um, how do we build structures where individual actions have consequences and they have consequences on an individual level and they also have consequences on the level of the entire community and they're affecting everybody uh, what we've chosen to do. And the space that I would look at most for sort of suggestions for bringing this into video games would actually be um, role playing games and uh, tabletop role playing games and LARP because there are a lot of story games that attempt to provide some kind of structure by which everybody at the table gets to contribute in a way that feels true to them. Now, those are still relying on a human mediator, so that's something where um, you know, we don't have the equivalent of the DM in play, but those are still really um, useful ways of approaching this set of issues and thinking about what options would we even allow to the players to make that kind of an effective agency space. Uh, and then a final thing that I'm really interested in is the problem of maximizing player expressiveness. Uh, so what I mean by expressiveness um, is that a lot of the time, especially in the narrative parts of games, so in dialogue trees, in cutscenes with choices, um, a lot of the time the story part of the game actually allows the player to express themselves in a much more limited way than the rest of the game. If it's embedded in a shooter, if it's embedded with, in something with physics mechanics, you're spending most of the time uh, being able to make sort of multi different choices. I'm choosing when to reload my ammo, I'm choosing where to run and when and how. Um, but when you get into these choice mechanics, it's like pick A, B, or C. Um, and I, of course, you know, three, because of the GDC talk that told us that three was the right number of choices. But still, that's really constraining for the player in terms of what they're able to do. So I think it's, it's a useful space for us to think about what if we could, could allow the player to make choices that are operating on several levels, right? There's a choice of what they want to do, but there might also be choices about how they want to do it, about how they want to perform um, their character action, about how they want to represent themselves. There might be kind of styling. Um, to the way that they're playing that scene. So to give a little sort of idea of what I'm even on about, uh, second video here. Um, this is from a Game Jam game that I made um, for last Halloween. It was for Halloween Jam. Um, and I was using Character Engine, um, but I was working with it quite quickly. So um, it, it has about a week's worth of content. And what's going on here is the story is that you are a ghost haunting this house. Um, and the person who lives in the house comes downstairs and says, look, could you please stop making weird creaking noises in the attic because I can't sleep. Um, and so you get into this conversation with her. And 
what's happening is we've got these dialogue choices in much the same way that one might in a, in a sort of standard interface, but we also have some options that allow us to choose, actually, what do we want to see in our dialogue choices? Do we want to express anger? Do we want to express hunger? Um, do I want to hone in on specific topics that she's mentioned? Um, and as you kind of continue to interact with her, you open up more and more possibilities for how you want to express yourself. And these possibilities actually work in combination as well, because if you choose to be um, open and curious at the same time, you're going to be playing kind of uh, an accessible, vulnerable, uh, get to know you kind of ghost. Um, and if you're playing angry and hungry, then you're the kind of ghost that's going to set the house on fire and kill all of the inhabitants. Um, and you can kind of remix those and remix them at different points during the game. And you're really, you're making some choices about how you're going to interact with her, the relationship that you're developing with her, um, whether you're going to be mean to her or not, what you're curious about from the backstory, but you're also deciding what kind of personality uh, you want to portray. And so this is a much more potentially expressive um, kind of set of options than that would typically be. All right, so um, let me, there we go. All right, so overall, mysterious and worrying problems, they're fun to work on. Um, and in fact, they provide some of the most promising space to do game jam work because a lot of them are underexplored, meaning that you can throw something together in a couple days time and build out uh, an exploration of that space that really hasn't been delved into before. Because there's so much unexplored territory that even a sort of a small sortie into that space can be quite informative and you're not up against the sort of issues, you know, if you're working with trying to solve the better known kinds of problems, then it becomes I'm gonna invest a lot of time into polish, into exceeding what has been done by other people in the space in order to have something to say with it. But if you're working in an unexplored territory or an underexplored territory, it's a lot easier to get to novelty. Um, and the other point that I wanted to make is that if you have a non-alluring problem or what looks to you like a non-alluring problem, if you're being asked to, as a professional game writer or narrative designer, to work with something that is essentially business driven and you have somebody saying to you, like, we gotta A-B test this and then go with whatever is going to extract the most money out of people and that makes you feel uncomfortable, um, one of the use useful things to do with that is to try and reframe it as an alluring <coughs> problem. Like, what would be the interesting version of this issue from a narrative design perspective. And if I can solve that, then I can serve this business need and not have too great a sense of shame. Unless somebody comments on your blog and makes you feel bad anyway. But you know, you can try. All right. Uh, so that's me. Thanks for listening. say that this is going to be an interesting juxtaposition following Emily's talk. Um, anyway, so my talk is called What Your Ice Cream Flavor Says About You. Uh, a few words about me first, though. I am a gameplay engineer. Oops, I'm going to go back one. Uh, I am a gameplay engineer. That means that I am a uh, trained computer scientist. I type braces and semicolons for a living in the service of game designers. Sometimes the game designer is me, but most of the time it's somebody else. Uh, I've been doing this for about 27 years. Uh, this is some stuff that I worked on. By the way, if I'm talking fast, it's because I have like 20 minutes to get through 40 minutes of slides. So. Um, here's some stuff that I worked on. Um, I very recently, last month, just published my first board game, so I'm super excited about that. I'll have it at the after party if you want to see it. Um, and I do a lot of speaking on game design. So some of you may know my hit singles, Eight Kinds of Fun, and Mechanics, Dynamics, Aesthetics. Anyone heard of either of those things? Yep. Yeah, a little? All right, hopefully. Uh, so I am not at all related to this guy, <laughs> or that lady, okay? Um, lastly, um, I work for Riot, but please don't blame them for anything I say. Um, these are my thoughts. 
Um, so my talk is going to be about what makes a choice expressive, right? So how do we empower players to express themselves through their choices, right? And can we quantify the expressiveness of decision? And I'm going to use a lot of math to explain stuff that you may already know intuitively, right? So um, the real title of the talk is not what your ice cream player says about you, it's how much your ice cream player says about you, okay? Um, and so from the mechanics dynamics of framework, Aesthetics framework perspective. You guys, have you guys seen this? Yeah. MBA framework, yay, good. Um, so we're talking about, the MBA framework is talking about like how do we create structures that produce behaviors that create emotional content, right? And so for this talk, we're gonna mostly be talking about these last two boxes, right? Like how can we understand the relationship between the behaviors that occur in the game and a particular uh, emotional payload that we want to deliver? In particular, how do choices lead to expression, right? Uh, and I'm not to end, just to clarify against uh, Emily's talk, I'm talking about all the choices that might emerge during a game, like what weapon to use, what hat to wear, what card to play, um, not necessarily strictly authored choices that you've been presented. Um, so credit where credit's due, I was inspired to give this talk by a colleague of mine, David Abacassas, and he, I was working with him, and he said this. He said that if you choose for more options, that's more expressive than choosing from few. Uh, apparently, exactly three, though, um, <laughs> in the narrative case. But, and so his example was like, hey, if I give you, if I'm going to give you ice cream and I give you the choice between chocolate and vanilla, right, like that's a, le you know, and I learned something about you what, but from which one you choose, right? I learned a little bit. But that's less uh, expressive than if I give you, like, a whole 32 flavors to choose from, right? And so, like, that was his piece, right? And so how to quantify that, right? So one thing is, like, if we take your ice cream choice, choices and we consider how to send that, that choice as a message to somebody, right? If we have just chocolate or vanilla, that's a one-bit choice, right? I can encode that as zero means chocolate and one means vanilla, and I can send that over a wire. It's a one-bit choice, right? Um, if I have 32 choices, so this is the original Baskin Robbins menu plus no thanks, all 31 <laughs> flavors plus no thanks, um, uh, then I need five bits, right, to, uh, to encode that message, right? Um, so we can kind of think of like, hey, that's a one big information choice, and this is a five big information choice. And so already we've learned something from doing this kind of quantum, uh, quantification, right? Because it captures the diminishing returns, right, of, of doing that, right? Like having 30 choices is not 16 times better than having two choices, right? It's only five times better, right? And to get to six times better, I have to double to 64, right? Um, so now we are going down the rabbit hole of information. And that's the math of how much information is contained in a signal, right? Like these three images, they have the same number of pixels, right? But they don't contain the same amount of information, right? And like a compression algorithm, a good one, would treat them very differently, right? In terms of the final like, file size. And so the first thing you learn in Information Theory 101 is that information is relative to expectation, right? So let's think about this, um, uh, this chocolate versus vanilla example. Um, and we imagine we have 50 people. We have 50 people, and I'm going to give them ice cream, and I need to take their orders. Um, and I take down all their orders, and I can send that as a message of just 50 bits, right? There they are. Um, and this message pretty much, if, if chocolate and vanilla are equally popular, and for the purpose of this talk, they are, right? um, this is pretty much random noise, right? Like, there's no, there's no helpful shorthand. Like, these 50 bits are probably the smallest message I'm going to be able to send. Right? There's no helpful shorthand uh, for uh, how to uh, get this, this message uh, smaller. Um, so we have basically one bit of value generated per person. Um, so now let's consider uh, any, uh, the same problem, but instead of choosing between chocolate and vanilla, we're choosing between chocolate and vomit flavor. <laughs> okay, so now I would expect that of these 50 bits, we're gonna see the, like, the one or two smart asses <laughs> order the vanilla. Right? And mostly everyone goes for the chocolate, right? And there's an expressive asymmetry here, right? If you choose chocolate between chocolate and vomit, I really haven't learned how much you like chocolate, right? What I've learned is how much you don't like vomit, <laughs> right? Um, and, but if you choose vomit over chocolate, then I've learned something about you. Um, so like this choice is asymmetrical in its expressiveness, right? Um, but overall, it's less information, right? Um, all right, so if I want to construct a, uh, my, my things have not, uh, so I can construct a shorthand for this message, right? Like I can, uh, any, any one of these messages, right, it's probably gonna have long runs of zero. <coughs> like, 
Slides went over to a different computer and they don't line up, but that's okay. You get, you'll get a run of 32 zeros followed by a run of four zeros, followed by, uh, followed by one, followed by a run of four zeros, followed by one, followed by a, a, a run of 12 zeros, right? And you would expect any string that's a choice between chop and vomit to be, have this structure, right? Long runs of zeros with the occasional one, right? So we can, we can uh, like come up with a code uh, that encodes that more densely, right? So what I can do is I can say, you know what, I'm gonna give you six bits of run length. I'm gonna give you a number from zero to, uh, to 63 that's a number of zeros to write down, right? And then I'm gonna give you a zero or one, and then I'm gonna just repeat that, right? So if we take that, we can compress this string uh, into, so the number 32, followed by the number one, followed by the number four, followed by the number one, followed by the number 12, right? Um, and that's a much shorter message, right? It's a 20-bit message instead of a 50-bit message, right? And so one interesting thing about this is that the encoding captures the asymmetry of the expressiveness of the decision, right? If you choose vomit, you are adding seven bits to the message I have to write down, right? Uh, if you're choosing chocolate, you're adding like seven sixty-fourths of a bit. Um, and like, if you have trouble with like the idea of a fractional bit, I had this whole metaphor of like the bit is both the pint glass and the beer in the pint glass. You're gonna have half a pint of beer in a pint, but I don't have time. Um, <laughs> so, but if we think about it, right? We went from tw we went from 50 bits to 20, which means that the average value of this this decision, the average value, average over all of those 50 people, um, the average information content is only four tenths of a bit, right? So the average, the aggregate expressive power. Right, is like forty percent less. Uh, sorry, sixty percent less. Right, um, but one thing to understand is when we we chose this encoding, and it's not the best encoding. Those of you who are mathematically inclined are already optimizing it. Yes, congratulations. Um, <laughs> this encoding that we've chosen is a predictive model of how the the, the players are going to choose. Right, we chose six bits for run length. Right, when we were, when we chose that number, we were making a predictive model of the frequency of, of the vomit choice, right? We could have chosen more bits, or we ch could have chosen fewer bits, depending on how frequently we thought, uh, we thought that was gonna happen. So, for example, and this is the densest slide in the talk, so just brace yourself. Um, so if, if the, the ones are more common than we, we expected, if, more, if we got more smart asses than we expected, right? We might have a string like this, like here's a 21 uh, bit string of you know, pretty dense, um, right, and so to encode that in our, in our encoding, it would take actually 27 bits, right? You have a run of three, and then a one, and then a run of seven, and then a one, and then a run of five, and then a one, and then a run of three, and then up. And it's actually, the encoding is longer than the original, than the original message, right? So this is like a, a prediction error, right? We, we ch we've ch chosen a bad code in that case, right? We could have, if we had just uh, compressed our run down to like three bits, yeah, we get, we get uh, a 15. Now, the other case is what if the ones are much less common? What if there are no smart asses, right? Like you, so imagine a, 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 a string that's 200 zeros in a row, right? So we'd have to encode that as a run of 63 zeros followed by a zero, followed by a run of 63 zeros followed by a zero, another run of 63 zeros and a zero and a run of eight bits, right? So that's 27 bits, which is better than 200, granted, but not as good as if we had just said our run length is eight bits and that would be eight bits because we just put the number and we can go. Okay. All right. So backing away from the math. Okay. Um, <coughs> the messages that don't match our predictive model are longer than they need to be, right? And they suggest that we should make revisions to our model. Right, that's what I'm getting at. Right. Um, and so, one way we can think about expression is that we express ourselves by defining prediction, right? Uh, when I make an expressive choice, I'm making a choice that reveals flaws in people's expectations, right? So like if there's some ice cream store, you don't know anything about this ice cream store, right? I mean, except that it's an ice cream store, right? So it's gonna serve ice cream. And I come out with chocolate ice cream, like you learned something about me, but not as much as if I had come out with Phyrexian peanut butter corruption. That's an actual ice cream flavor. Um. So, right, so 
Options create expressive value when they hinder predictions. So there's some implications here, right? An option that nobody wants has no value, right? Potentially negative value. We'll talk about that, right? So um, let's say, so if I give you a, a chocolate versus vanilla decision, we, we said that's approximately one bit of value. Um, now if I add vomit to the list, right? Now you can have chocolate or vanilla or vomit. Like we assume that almost nobody's gonna pick the vomit if they have choice of chocolate. Uh, so it's probably still around a one bit, uh, a one bit value, right? However, right, uh, uh, Barry Schwartz, a psychologist, wrote this book called The Paradox of Choice, where he observed that bad options still add cost to your decisions, right? Like, having more options, even if they're bad, like, adds cognitive load to you actually making the decision you want, right? So, while adding the extra bad option doesn't improve the expressive power of the decision, uh, it increases the cost. Right? So the ROI on that decision is not going to be as good uh, with the vomit option in there. Like, I, you know, I, this was my first talk outside of North America, and I was worried that I was going like, to like discover that like, Irish people love vomit-flavored ice cream. <laughs> I'm glad that that didn't happen. Because um, uh, that really would have made it not work at all. Um, so, and then the other side of it, like, what about an option that everybody wants? Right? Well, that's potentially destructive to expression, right? So, like, let's say I have to give you a choice between a blue hat and a red hat. Wear a blue hat or red hat, right? Hey, that's one big choice. We've already established choosing between two things is one big choice where they're both equally popular. Um, now, if I add another equally popular thing, right, like a green hat, that's in this world, the primary colors are all equally desirable. Just, just follow up. Um, so that's a one bit. That's a one point six bit choice now. So I gained like a point six bits of, uh, of value from adding that one more option, right? But all right, so now let's go back to that. And instead of red or blue, we add like red or blue or awesome Viking hat that everybody wants, right? Now all of a sudden, like this is the inverse of the, of the vomit thing. Like everybody's gonna want the Viking hat, right? And nobody's gonna get red or blue anymore, right? That, so that like makes the whole aggregate choice like down to about two, like, Maybe two tenths a bit, depends on the, the how much everyone really wants that. But let's say it's two tenths a bit. Now we made it we've destroyed the expressive power of this choice by like, you know, picking something that everybody wants. Right? So another uh, another implication of this is that like sometimes people will make prediction errors, right? Like, um, you know, if I give if I uh, if I give a player a bunch of options and there's an option that's really common, but nobody knows that it's really common. Um, the player can like feel like they're <coughs> expressing themselves more than they actually are, um, and that can be a big win for you because you understand what the player is going to do, and the play but the player you know feels like they're um, they're uh, uh, they're they're expressing themselves, um, and so this kind of this kind of asks the question: Who's doing the predicting in all of this, right? So does expressing yourself require a witness? Uh, is it, can you only express yourself relative to the witness's knowledge? Um, can you express yourself to a robot? Um, so, yeah, going to that first one, like if a choice, if you make a choice and there's no one there to observe or predict it, like, can you express to yourself essentially? Like, and I would hypothesize that yes, uh, that some players do, um, and players are essentially doing this inception thing where they're imagining how an observer, a, a hypothetical observer would predict their choice. So they're predicting their predictor, right? And then sort of gaming that uh, prediction to express themselves. I, this is a hypothesis. It seems like it's testable, right? I mean, like you could run a psych lab and sort of like figure this out, right? And for all I know, it's been tested, but um, uh, I don't know. I have imagined that, so it's true. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> who, like who, all right, it's just, Informal say, who as a show of hands, playing a game by yourself, imagine an observer like watching you play at the game and like feel like expressing yourselves by the observer. I'll be like, all right, so not, I'm not totally crazy, okay? <laughs> you can keep doing it, it's not weird. Uh, <laughs> so the other thing is the question of like, about the, the, the observer's knowledge, just familiarity negate expression. So here's two TV shows, 
Um, and uh, the only thing you need to know about Luffy is that in both TV shows, the character on the right is sitting in his favorite seat. And in both of these shows, it's, and I don't know why it's on the right, really, it was just a 50 50 chance, so don't read too much into that, right? Um, uh, in both of these shows, it's established over multiple episodes that that character is in their favorite seat, and you better not sit in it because it's their favorite seat, right? So once I know that about that person, is choosing that seat an expressive choice anymore? Because I'm going to predict that they're going to choose that, right? Um, that's a good question. And, 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 and an interesting thing about it is that, that from a narrative perspective, if you're writing a television show, you can establish this over multiple episodes, and then you can have the payoff where the guy gives the seat away, and it's this big, now, expressive choice. Because they set your predictive model up to do one thing, uh, and, then, and then they went another way, right? Um, but if we think of these, these, these two characters, instead of thinking of them as characters, we think of them as players of a video game, right? Like when you pick your you know, favorite champion in League of Legends over and over and over and over again, you feel like you're expressing yourself each and every time, even though all of your friends know that you're gonna pick Darius again. Um, uh, so like my recommendation, is, like to the extent that, this, that anything that I'm saying is practical, um, we want to think about like, hey, we need a hypothetical, think about how they're expressing themselves to sort of a hypothetical, naive observer who knows about people in general, knows about the cultural context, but maybe <coughs> doesn't know about you, right? And I'm going to call that, that person Pat, <laughs> Pat the predictor, okay? And uh, so what do we know, like what are some common like predictive heuristics that ordinary people use to predict other people's behavior? And so what do we know about Pat? Right, so I'm gonna make a predictive model of Pat, which is like super meta, and I just realized that. But anyway, um, so first of all, Pat is pragmatic. So if we consider the choice between, uh, you know, I'm gonna give you, uh, you can have chocolate ice cream, or you can have uh, vanilla ice cream and 100 euro. Um, fully localized talk. Uh, can I say quid? Is that like a thing you guys use for Yeah, yeah? okay. But you can't say fun and then sound. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> I renamed him in the middle of writing the talk. <laughs> Pat is pragmatic. Hey, look, even on the... Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow, Pat, yeah, all right. I thought Pat the predictor was better. Uh, all right, so anyway, Pat thinks you're going to take the 100 euro, right? Right? Pat has a pragmatic bias, right? He's pragmatic. Um, he predicts that you're going to seek like wealth and comfort, right? And so, like, if you think about it, this this model now now like explains and predicts conspicuous consumption, right? Like, like conspicuous consumption is the act <coughs> of defying Pat's expectation that you are going to be pragmatic, right? Um, it's it's expressive waste, right? And so, if you're selling cool Viking hats, right? Um, you might want to consider raising the price on the cool Viking hat. And not only does that make you more money, and you know, that's good if we're in the money making business, but we can actually increase the expressive value of the Viking hat to the player by making it rarer, by raising its price. Don't do it for evil. <laughs> um, you know, don't raise the price on creepy things that everyone wants, like sexual autonomy. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but we can use, we can use pragmatism as a tuning lever, right, uh, to, to bring, uh, to bring the rarity of, of individual choices in line with the other choices and increase their expressive power. The Viking hat is an example of that. Pat, not Sam, screw Sam, uh, Pat is competitive, right, so, the, so a variation on the pragmatic, pragmatic thing for games is that Pat, thinks you want to win, right? So he thinks you're gonna choose, or she, thinks you're gonna choose high win percentage choices over low win percentage choices, right? Like, um, and so there's sort of like uh, a way to express yourself through trolling, right? Like expressive trolling. I'm throwing the game to make a statement, right? Um, uh, yeah, and so there's a fundamental tendency to like, there's a fundamental tension between expression and mastery that I'll get into more later. Um, Pat expects you to express yourself, 
right? Like other things equal, at Pat, for one thing, Pat is going to read more self-expression into what you are choosing than is probably even there. Um, and, and conversely, players, when they're making the choices, they're going to underestimate their expressive power. And that's due to the fundamental attribution error. Right? Who knows what the fundamental attribution is? Anyone of people who's familiar with fundamental attribution error? It's basically a fact of psychology that we attribute the choices of other people to their inherent personality traits. Like if I see you run a red light, it's because you're a scofflaw who has no respect for traffic safety. And when I run that exact same light on the, ex on the next day at the exact same time, it's because, well, I'm in a circumstance where, I'm, if you knew how much of a hurry I was in, you know, uh, so we think of our own choices as being like rational and situational and other people's choices as being just sort of indicative of their character. And that kind of works against us, right, in, the, in terms of the expressive power of the choice. Because, because the, the, the player, oftentimes, is going to think that they're making a rational choice, not an expressive choice, right? So uh, how are we doing on time? Like, are you guys going to cut the power if I keep talking? Or? I'll keep talking. I'll keep talking. Great. All right, so let's talk about this thing I alluded to, the, the, the tension between expression and mastery. So one thing is like, hey, I can. I can express myself by losing a game. We've sort of established that. Conspicuous consumption of defeat, if you will, <laughs> right? And so there's often tension there, right? Design, so design, like, actual choices that affect gameplay that are expressive, designing those is freaking hard, right? So let's talk about this game. This game is called Roll One Through Five. And you get to pick which die to roll. You can either roll the boring-looking 10-sided die or the awesome steampunk-looking 12-sided Right? And you want to roll a one through five. You know, if you do that, then you know, you make it to the next round or you, you know, win a dollar or whatever. Um, and so like obviously this is a better from a probabilistic perspective, right? To roll the plan looking, you know, blue die. But you know, awesome steampunk 12-sided die on the other side, right? So and a, a mastery player, a player who values mastery, right, as a as an as an end goal, is gonna pick the better win percentage. Um, and we, but an expressive player might say, you know what, that eight, those eight percentage points, um, they're probably not even doing the math, right? And we can imagine choices that are even closer than this, right, in terms of, uh, in terms of like actual uh, victory value, right? But the expressive players might, make, might be like, hey, those eight percentage points, ah, it's worth spending those. I'm gonna spend those to, to, do, you know, to do the awesome thing. Um, so there's tension, right, between the expressive player and the mastery player. Like, like if you have a close decision, not necessarily like a, a wildly skewed decision, if you, have, if you have two choices that are nearly good, right, then the mastery player is going to eke out every little advantage that they get, right, and the expressive player is going to be like, ah, uh, good enough, I might want to use this as an expressive choice, right? And so, like, what happens when the expressive player and the mastery player like come into contact. Well, if you like, if you're in a high level WoW raid and you show up with like your, you know, your pretty armor that's like low level but looks cool, like the, all the mastery players on your team are going to be really mad at you, right? So like, you know, in a PV, in a same team PVE kind of situation, or even a PVP kind of situation, <coughs> that can be talking. Talk. On the other hand. If you are, if you show up to a magic tournament like with your awesome, you know, deck where all the all the cards have your favorite artist, you know, because you love that artist, right? And your deck's not very good, but you really like the one creature, right? That like, you know, is like the big twenty twenty guy that's gonna <coughs> that's gonna you know win if it hits the table, um, and you only care if that hits the table one game in three, right? And across from you, sitting across the table from you, is a guy who just wants to win two times out of three. He's perfectly happy for you to get your creature out the one time in three if he gets the other two, right? So there, there's opportunities for in, PV, uh, in PvP situations when expressive players and mastery players are sitting across from each other that there's actually, actually synergy, symbiosis there, right? Um, there's actually an interesting phenomenon in, um, in uh, Magic Online where there, uh, in draft games there are, there are sort of um, players who play the draft so this is where like you draft cards and then you play a tournament with the drafted card. 
and you get to keep the cards you've drafted regardless of your turn turn outcome. And there are players who just want to like, who are just collectors who are just like, oh, I want to get that card, uh, and they and they don't care if they win the tournament. They just want to get draft cool cards. And uh, uh, and then there's players who just they just want to win the tournament, and they'll you know and they'll give up rare cards for powerful cards. Um, and these players actually find each other, like they favor tournaments with each other in them because each one is going to help the other one's goals, right? Um, and then what happens when the nasty player and the expressive player are at the same player, right? Anguish. Why can't, designer, why did you give me this choice, right? Um, so that's something we have to, that's, that's the, it's hard to design expressive gameplay choices. Um, so that's my talk, uh, pretty much. Here's, so the takeaway, so we can use uh, information theory as a model of expressiveness, right? We can think about message size, right? Um, some choices are asymmetrically oppressive, I I expressive, right? Like choosing vomit's really expressive, choosing chocolate, not so much, but that kind of choice is a net loss for your player base overall, right? And we can, ex we can, uh, we can frame expressiveness as prediction dependence. Um, Options create expressive value when they limit prediction. An option that no, no one wants has no value. An option that everyone wants has overall negative value. Right? And to understand the expressive value of choice, we must know how Pat will predict it. Pat is pragmatic. Pat is competitive. He is not named Sam. And he expects <laughs> expression. Um, and then expression and mastery can come into conflict. How are we doing on time? We're good. We're good. Awesome. All right, that's all I got. Creativity in the games is fantastic, and uh, for those of you who are coming behind, there's, there's a barrage to be set, has been set, and uh, we expect you to reach it, uh, beat it. Um, to everybody else who shows up, a lot of familiar faces who come every year. Um, uh, do you not have anything else to do on a Friday? Um, and I thank you for supporting the events year on year. Blah, 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 and it's getting over with. <laughs> So we're going down to um, Alfie Burns, which is in the, it's the, Cono, it's the Cono Hotel, isn't it? Um, and um, uh, yeah, we'll see you there. Thanks very much again. Thanks very much.
really liked your kids' cards. Cool. Oh, the, the green man stuff. That's cool, man. Oh, yeah. He did it like it's it's really fun. It's really fun. It's really fun. There's no info. It's just it's just his inspiration. Yeah, that's cool. And the Viking came back. Good job. That's cool. <laughs> Yeah. It was literally what's on the note. It's like, he says, like, you're doing great work or something like that. <laughs> like, okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.